Madness will come into our conversation today, somewhat explicitly. Now, maybe there's been a madness in what we've been doing all along, pursuing questions about the meaning of life. I suppose if we're to be open and honest, as we go on our journey, we always have to keep asking ourselves, are these the sorts of questions that it's best to outgrow? Or are these the sorts of questions that only arise if things aren't going well in our ordinary lives? But there's another line of thought, and we've been reflecting on it and going along on its journey during our time together. And that's the notion that perhaps questions regarding the meaning of life and his philosophy and different and sometimes conflicting ways can reflect on them, well, maybe pursuing those questions is a pathway to a kind of sanity. It doesn't need necessarily to be the case that a highly productive world is a super sane world. We could think that at least in a few ways that are worth reflecting on, the world is well, almost in certain ways, an insane world, one that has lost its moorings. And one thing that philosophy has attempted to do in its history is to offer, to suggest guidance for living. And we've been looking at different forms of guidance. Now, the various institutions that surround, support, and frankly, often restrict our activities, may be, bear an intimate relation to our understanding of ourselves. And we've given some thought to this in relation to both Hegel and Marx. Hegel thinking institutions can be very supportive of us and thinking they became so, at least in Germany after the French Revolution. Marx thinking that no, the world and its institutions do not support us. And we look briefly at his notion of the need for a revolution. Now we come to a French philosopher, Michel Foucault, who lived during the 20th century. Foucault claims that the way institutions operate often involves an oppressive imposition of conceptions of normalcy and propriety upon people. Oppressive conceptions as to what it would be to be normal. Some of you might remember a movie of some years ago, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, and there was the thought that the hospital situation in which the actor Jack Nicholson was in was actually an oppressive one, and he was actually sane and that, in fact, everything there was upside down or reversed. Well, Foucault takes almost as paradigmatic situations of a broad sort in which, in fact, institutions do oppress people. And for Foucault in the society in which we live, the prevailing rules and values, well, they express what dominant groups prefer, and then impose upon us. And those institutions, which we would like to think we all share in, even in decisions about how to make them up, those institutions turn out to be instruments through which various groups who have power exercise that power and control over others. And the subordinated people, well, they're then largely and often in subtle ways discredited and marginalized. And their perceptions and interests are not accorded any genuine legitimacy. We've seen various ways in which that's played out in the reflections that we've had. Uh, we've seen Marx's notion of the oppression of the working class. We've even seen from Kierkegaard the idea that religious institutions 
rather than in fact enhancing us, are often means of crowd control or means of giving us conventional doctrines that keep us from the serious religious task of nurturing our souls and finding a true and deep contact with God. And we've even looked for a while at these peculiar, in some ways disturbing views of Heidegger's, that mostly we live in an average everyday way, in an average everyday and conventional world, and are suffocated without even fully realizing it by that world's conventions. Now Foucault's most famous study, or at least the one for which his renown came to be, is a study of the history of the development of asylums. And this particular work is called Madness and Civilization. Madness and Civilization. It might have been called Madness and Reason, but by Civilization, Foucault means all those seemingly rational ways that the world is structured. And as we're going to see in a minute, he thinks of madness as a category that belongs to those who don't tidily fit into those seemingly rational ways we like to organize the world. Foucault, well, I guess this now is going to add a little bit of a complication to our different notions of enlightenment. Foucault talks about another enlightenment period still, in terms of the history of French ideas, a classical age, we'll call it that, when madness was used as a category uh, that included and lumped together the unemployed, the criminally active, the aged, and the physically ill. They were all put in one indiscriminate category, and in a broad sense kind of construed as mad. And in the name of reason, now remember after the French Revolution, reason becomes to be this great instrument through which we're going to have progress and we're going to make it a new, better world, overcome superstition. Well, in the name of reason, celebrated because of scientific advances, those who were deemed unreasonable or useless, again were marginalized and their social and even their personal human legitimacy was denied. And what this led to, of course, was a kind of social engineering, a kind of tyranny of utopian thinking that for many people was the aftermath, at least in the minds of those who were followers of French revolutionary thinking. If we could, let's linger a minute and reflect on the backdrop out of which some of these ideas came. Before the revolutionary activities that inspired so many and horrified others in Europe, revolutionary activities associated with what the French did to establish a rule of reason, it was thought that the way things were and the institutions as they were were more or less set in stone. Now after this revolutionary activity and this notion that superstition would be left behind and reason would prevail, it wasn't quite as if people were just left alone. What happened was that utopian ideas developed about how now free of the burdens of tradition and of the past, we could now, using reason, reach, so to speak, a brave new world. But the underlying idea that Foucault offers us is that that utopian urge for a new world might involve distinguishing useful people from useless people. The useful, the useless, and those who are construed in terms of some model of a utopianly better world as not so useful might be categorized as mad. Foucault claims that a transition occurred around 1800, a transition whereby 
mentally ill people, and this was a kind of gradual transition, came to be segregated. They came eventually to be segregated from the rest of these undesirables and were housed and now treated in a different way. They were treated as moral outcasts. Pause and keep in mind that what Foucault will want us to think and believe is that in important ways they were the same people, but one way of categorizing them, which lumped them with all kinds of other people, the aged, the people that were ill in a certain way, for all I know, philosophy professors, that one way gave way and a new way emerged. Same people, but a new way. And now, at this turning point, these same people, segregated off as mentally ill, were viewed as having something morally wrong with them. And therefore, they came to be treated as people needing moral instruction. If we're to understand Foucault in a way that would make him at least plausible to us, what he tells us is that an episteme had altered abruptly and dramatically. What he means by an episteme is a way of ordering our knowledge and ordering our sense of the power relations among things and defining by that way of ordering knowledge and power various social arrangements. Foucault came to understand epistemes and the abrupt change from one to another as the appropriate focus of his investigations. And he came to believe that when this particular episteme changed, a tyranny of, a tyranny of medical authority came to replace the moralism uh, 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 that had preceded it. A tyranny of medical authority was what next came. Let me pause with you to reflect a few minutes about this. Because Foucault's notion of an episteme, a radical change in an ordering principle, introduces something new, importantly new, into our thinking. Very intriguingly, Foucault had told us that the time of stories about unfolding coherent stages in the development of history was over. He attributed that to 19th century thinking. He continued to think that there were abrupt changes, abrupt transitions, but they didn't necessarily lead from one stage to a higher one, there was just some radical change of stages. For instance, in the model that I've conveyed to you, a change from lumping mentally ill people together with all kinds of other so-called fitness into the useless, then to viewing them as morally in need of instruction, and finally moving them on to construing them as belonging to a scientific medical establishment. And if we are to believe Foucault, these are not advances. They are just abrupt changes that occur. He is part of a 20th century kind of thinking that does not believe that what we have should be called progress. What we have underlying and is constitutive of the human spirit is simply abrupt changes. And in fact, when he received his most noted position, which was at the Collège de France, and they offered him a chair in philosophy, he said, no, I don't want a chair in philosophy. What I want is a chair in the history of the development of systems of thought. And again, he thought that these developments in the systems of thought were not particularly progress. They were just changes. And in, the, in fact, at the end of one of his most significant books, he makes a very dramatic claim. Uh, he writes in an engaging way, though of course inscrutably at times. He says, could it be, could it be that we will come to see man revered for ages as little more 
than a face drawn in the sand by the edge of the sea. And of course the notion that we get from that is that quite possibly what we've understood as the human could undergo a dramatic change. And of course the question then would be, is the change good, bad? Is it progress? Is it retreat? And Foucault's notion of episteme is that it's not necessarily any of those, and maybe both good and bad, it's just a change and a dramatic one that can happen. This is, of course, a strange idea, but uh, very early during my journey with you, I mentioned someone, an American named Peter Drucker, who has been the uh, leader of a business management institute. And Peter Drucker has said repeatedly and published on the theme that about every 200 years, there's a radical change in the way we understand ourselves. And that people 20 or 30 years from now, looking back, won't be able to understand actually what we were like. And we, now thinking about what the world might be like 20 or 30 years from now, can't imagine what it will be like. Drucker says about every 200 years that sort of thing happens. If Drucker had been Foucault, he would have said, we are on the edge of, we are undergoing and going through an episteme. Foucault was very much concerned to champion the outsider, the person who not only was outside of the power arrangement in the sense of being out of a position of privilege and power, but also the person that was disadvantaged, oppressed by the power arrangements of his or her time. In that sense, he was very concerned for causes that would take various forms of downtrodden people and find some way to liberate them from those arrangements of power that kept them from having genuine opportunities, or at least a minimal level of equality with other people. And in fact, he understood language itself, often to harbor prejudice and oppression, and thereby limit even the very means by which various forms of outcast and in a few cases, creative spirits could express their individuality and their opposition to prevailing norms. There is a way the powerful can use language uh, in such a way as to express things to the disadvantage of others. I mean, in a very trivial way, I don't give tests. I tell my students they're writing opportunities. But after all, that's a strange use of language, isn't it? But as the powerful person in my little classroom, I can call something what I want. And people have to say, oh my goodness, tomorrow's a writing opportunity. Now I've given you a very trivial case, but it's the sort of thing that in subtle ways, Foucault says, goes on all the time in our world. Uh, actually, he was influenced by things Heidegger said about this, and he was alert, Foucault was, to, to the need to question linguistic predispositions themselves. And I think we can all realize that words can very much harm people. I mean, there are words we wouldn't even want to use as illustrations. So I'll give you some words as illustrations that I think are not that harmful, could even be funny. Egghead, airhead, pointy-headed intellectual, we now talk sometimes a little less about people than we talk about human resources. For instance, in many places what you do is uh, you go to the human resource center and you are of course a human resource and you go to find out what kind of a resource you're turning out to be. And though there was a time of counseling and guidance and quite probably you live in a different world than I do, uh, what we have now is personnel management. Now, if Foucault's right, well, of course, in a way, language is language. We don't have to take it that seriously. But if Foucault is right, a whole series, pervasive series of these kinds of words, in fact, give us an experience and an understanding of ourself gradually, subtly, and growingly that 
even disadvantages us whatever advantages we might otherwise have. I mean, the old example from years ago when uh, we had the business of political correctness was you couldn't any longer have the mailman come. It had to be the person person. And it's very odd that Foucault, who had a great deal to do with getting more appreciative of how language can oppress us, this shows you how strange the world is in which we live, this very same Foucault was viewed as a kind of, uh, not high priest, but a kind of inspiration to those people who we now uh, uh, experience as the uh, kind of leaders of political correctness movements. Now, the purpose of questioning language for Foucault was in part to open a liberating and free space in which creative activities could take place, unimpeded by various stifling norms. Foucault also championed the need to transgress established values. In that sense, he could be viewed as someone that liked not only the proverbial beat or bohemian or hippie type or artist type, but he wanted to champion in some way outrageous things. Outrageous just to show that there are no necessary norms that circumscribe what life ought to be or the attitudes that we ought to take. That most of the rules and norms we live with are historically bound and they really have the character of our current cultural and social circumstances. What Foucault also suggests is that there are disparate perspectives on issues ranging from penal practices, oh, beyond that to diverse uses of language and philosophical discourse, even to the place of self-creation in the often oppressive set of social circumstances in which we're in. And he has very interesting reflections on the role of surveillance, not only in prison circumstances, but also in the larger society. The philosopher Jeremy, Jeremy Bentham talked about a panopticon, an all-seeing device. And that Foucault reflects on and sees the notion of a panopticon, an all-pervasive seeing device, is in fact a pervasive phenomenon of our time and a threat to our sense of freedom and unfettered decision-making. He suggests that in a way we live in a world where we're encouraged to believe we are always being watched and that in a sense outside of any official institution or prison, hospital, we nonetheless always feel as if we're being looked at. Uh, for instance, I'm often told that I should go to the website of a particular store I've shopped in and to rate the service I got from the person who sold me something. Well, I don't think that's about evaluating that person. I think it's about having that person think that he or she is always, always being watched. This would be an example of a kind of oppressive activity that Foucault thinks we're subject to in subtle ways. Oh my, that's a hard one as you think about it, is how often it is the case that you have this sense that you're being watched. Foucault claims that the fluid contextual world in which we find ourselves is best illumined in diverse linguistic ways and creatively you could use fictional ways to do so. He's a kind of perspectivalist. He thinks reality is much more than philosophical thinking can grasp and that there's a fullness to the world that language insufficiently reflects. He says, in effect, uh, it's people who think about the world that are simple, not the world. Foucault, in this respect, actually is following in the footsteps of Nietzsche and the notion that language at its best can be a creative set of metaphors. Foucault turns to understanding self-creation as a carving out of a space a space in the midst of those complex and shifting power structures and arrangements that pervade our environment. His main concern is not to elevate and enhance society, it's to find a special particular space 
to be carved out in a precariously, pervasively, pervasively uh, dominating society, a space where we can develop as particular individuals. And he claims, it's a funny use of the word technology, that technologies of the self must be developed. Special ways of coming to work and deal with ourselves that would allow us to create our lives and release our energies. And he takes a special interest in human sexuality as a place where power, knowledge, and self-crafting and individuality can emerge and have emerged historically. I do want to say some things to you also about Jürgen Habermas, a German philosopher of the 20th century. Because Jürgen Habermas, much unlike Foucault, they could hardly be very much different than they already are, is not particularly concerned with the opportunities that could be made available to potentially special individuals. His concern could more broadly be viewed as engendering a solidarity, a means by which communities could enlarge, could find more and more ways, if not to merge with each other, no, that wouldn't be his idea, but if they could find ways better to communicate with each other in ways that involved mutuality, mutual respect, an open communication, a communication that wasn't underneath it all, an attempt through what was said to dominate. So Habermas must be understood, and especially as a post-Second World War European philosopher, concerned with such things as the European community, in developing a notion of reason beneath, within, and beyond our ordinary and differing languages, a means of reasoning together that will be genuinely communicative, where reason is not rationalism, reason is genuine open communication. He believes that there must be a rational critique of existing institutions. Yes, he thinks they can always be made better he thinks that our ways of communicating must expand. It sounds a little like globalization, globalization of communication, taking reason and its communicating capabilities and enlarging them to engender eventually a world community. And what he has in mind is that our reason must not be limited to specific contexts. What Habermas wishes too, but less for the individual than for groups who could eventually come to have closer connections with each other. What he wants and what he seeks is to emancipate us from various forms of oppression, distortion, but again he wants to pursue this not for the sake of the individual, but as a universalizable human product and project of consciousness. Habermas thought that philosophy went wrong in emphasizing the isolated subject. He is very critical of Nietzsche. He is very, very critical of Heidegger. He does not think that philosophy, insofar as it concerns itself with the meaning of life, should direct its attention to practices, opportunities, reflections, and questions that would bear most centrally on the individual. No. Habermas thinks that a quest for the meaning of life, if he would truly choose to use such language, should emphasize the opportunities for a life together in a growing community where the dominant notion is not dominance at all, but an open, honest communication. Historically, he was the figure more than anyone in Germany who was the critic of Heidegger's oracular ideas and the one that suggested that a true future would have to be a future for all of us 
And again, it would have to involve an opening of more and ways, more and more ways of free, dominance-free communication. Well, we have one more opportunity to talk with each other, and when we do that, I want to talk to you about a notion which I call thresholding. And I'll hope to be with you soon for that conversation.